One of the most significant mathematical discoveries in history was made in AD 628 by an Indian sage who lived atop a mountain in Rajasthan. After studying Indian philosophical theories on emptiness and the void, the renowned mathematician Brahmagupta, who lived from 598 to 670, produced a book that effectively originated and defined the concept of zero. Brahmagupta was born close to Mount Abu, a high station in Rajasthan. He authored a 25-chapter dissertation on mathematics when he was 30 years old, and it was instantly acknowledged as a work of astounding intricacy and brilliance. As the first mathematician to interpret the circular zero sign, which was formerly simply a dot, as a number equal to the others rather than just an absence, he created rules for arithmetic that included this extra symbol in addition to the other nine. For the first time, any number up to infinity could be written using just 10 unique symbols. The nine Indian number symbols developed by earlier generations of Indian mathematicians plus zero. These were made possible by these fundamental mathematical principles. Even now these guidelines are taught in classrooms all across the world. Another of Brahmagupta's contributions was a system of mathematical rules for managing positive and negative integers, which he recorded in Sanskrit poetry. A full millennium before Isaac Newton, he appears to have been the first in other texts to characterize gravity as an attracting force. However, Brahmagupta was not alone, and he believed that he was building on the achievements of Aryabhata, who lived from 476 to 550, an earlier Indian genius. The latter's work deals in detail with spherical trigonometry and includes a very near approximation of pi's value of 3.14. His technique made it easy to calculate the motions of planets, eclipses, the size of the Earth, and most amazing of all, the precise length of the solar year to seven decimal places. This had obvious ramifications for astronomy. Additionally, his proposal of a spherical Earth rotating on its own axis was accurate. He stated, By the grace of Brahma, I swam deep into the ocean of theories true and false and using the boat of my own intellect, I rescued the precious sunken jewel of true knowledge. These two men's theories, which combine the mathematical knowledge of ancient India, made their way from India to the Arab world and farther west, where they gave rise to the precise form of numbers that we use today, as well as important mathematical notions like zero. In Britain they are still taught in school that the majority of the greatest scientific discoveries in history came about as a result of the genius of ancient Greece. While Pythagoras and Archimedes are taught in elementary school, most of us are still entirely ignorant about mathematicians of comparable stature who are of Indian descent, and neither Brahmagupta nor Aryabhata are names that are recognizable to almost anybody outside of the intellectual community. They are credited for perfecting the global numeric system, which is perhaps the closest thing humanity has to a universal language. However, in the West we credit the Arabs, not the Indians, with creating our numeral system, from which we borrowed them. India's sometimes overlooked role as the economic pivot and civilizational engine at the center of the ancient and early medieval civilizations is still shockingly unknown to us. Indian education, religious ideals and understanding are among the most important pillars of our civilization, despite the fact that we in the West are mostly ignorant of this. Similar to ancient Greece, Ancient India developed a system of insightful responses to the major queries concerning the nature of the world, its functioning, our purpose for existing, and the best way to live. In the same way that Greece was to Rome, then to the rest of the Mediterranean and Europe, India was to Southeast, Central and even China during this period. It spread its political ideologies, architectural styles and philosophies throughout the entire region not via conquest but rather through sheer cultural sophistication and allure. India was a self-assured exporter of its own unique civilization for a millennium and a half, from around 250 BC to 1200 AD. It created an intellectual empire around itself that eventually became a concrete Indosphere, where its cultural influence was prominent. A staggeringly extensive mass transfer of Indian soft power in the areas of religion, art, music, dance, technology, astronomy, mathematics, medicine, language, and literature, was willingly and even eagerly received by the rest of Asia throughout this time. Along with the pioneering merchants, astronomers, astrologers, physicists, mathematicians, physicians, and sculptors, India was also the home of holy men, monks, 
and missionaries from various different schools of Hinduism and Buddhism. These many religious realms occasionally battled, occasionally coexisted and blended and occasionally competed. However, between them, they rose to rule over Asia's southeast, east and central regions. More than half of the world's population currently resides in regions where Indian religious and cultural concepts predominate or formerly did, and where men and women's imaginations were governed by Indian gods. The full range of early Indian influence has always existed, concealed in plain sight. It can be found in the place names of Burma and Thailand, in the Buddhism of Sri Lanka, Tibet, China, Korea, and Japan, in the murals and sculptures depicting the Ramayana and the Mahabharata in Laos and Cambodia, and in the Hindu temples of Bali. However, for some reason, the golden road of monsoon-driven maritime trade routes that united all of this into a single cultural unit, a vast Indosphere that spanned from the Red Sea to the Pacific, has never been acknowledged as the name or connection between all of these disparate locations and ideas. If India had such a profound impact on the faiths and civilizations surrounding it, why isn't the remarkable spread of its influence better recognized and understood? The devaluation of Indian history, culture, science and knowledge during the era when Thomas Babington Macaulay boldly declared that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia, is undoubtedly a lasting legacy of colonialism, particularly Victorian Indology. How could Victorian Britain's attempt to civilize India be justified if it were accepted that India was already a strong, intelligent and global civilization? How would you go about introducing civilization to an area of the world that you acknowledge has been incredibly civilized for hundreds of years, and that in fact, was influencing all of Asia well before Christianity arrived? Ironically, Indian concepts were largely responsible for the West's ability to advance eastward and conquer India. Thanks to a dynasty of Baghdad's viziers known as the Barmakids, literate Sanskrit converts from Buddhism, some of whose members had studied Indian mathematics in Kashmir, the numerals created in India were accepted by the Arabs by the 8th century. The Barmakids were the ones who dispatched missions to India in pursuit of Indian scientific books. As a consequence, in 773, a mission from Sindh delivered to Baghdad a collection of the writings of Brahmagupta and Aryabhata. A decade later, the Persian genius Khwarizmi, whose name is the source of our term algorithm and whose book, Kitab al-Jabr is the basis of our word algebra, skillfully summarized all the Sanskrit mathematical books kept in the House of Wisdom Library in Baghdad. It evolved into the foundation of mathematics throughout the Arab world. However, the book's original title, the compendious book on calculating by completion and balancing according to Hindu calculation, indicates where it got its inspiration. These concepts propagated throughout the Islamic world from Baghdad. When Leonardo of Pisa, well known by his moniker Fibonacci, and his father returned from Algeria to Italy in 1202. Years later, they discovered that their fellow countrymen were still bound by the Latin numerical system. Growing up in a Pisan trade station in Bejaia, Fibonacci acquired fluency in the Arabic language and Arabic mathematics. He composed the Liber Abaci or Book of Calculation upon his return at the age of 32. In Algeria, he was introduced to a wonderful kind of teaching that used the nine figures of the Indias, as he stated in the preface. Using the zero symbol, also known as Zephyr in Arabic, one may write any number. Learning about this made me quite happy. I so endeavored to write this book in order to prevent the Latino race from being perceived as mathematically illiterate in the future. Fibonacci's Librabaci is credited for popularizing the use of what are now known as Arabic numerals throughout Europe. This helped pave the way for the development of banking and accounting, which started in Italy under the Medici dynasty and then spread to the rest of Europe. These inventions contributed to the financial and commercial revolution that powered the Renaissance and eventually Europe's ascent as these ideas spread and it turned its eyes eastward to the riches of India, the cradle of these concepts. Because European business acumen and initiative likely contributed to Europe's advantage over India more than military power did. India's ideas traveled the world for a millennium along the Golden Road, changing it beyond recognition. Its ideas created the Indosphere, a cultural region that transcended national boundaries. Indian civilization and culture in this region changed everything they came into contact with. This raises the question, 
could they do so again? If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. Stay tuned for more fascinating stories from history and science.